My name is Ian Wallace. I'm a psychologist. I'm not a clinical psychologist. I'm just an ordinary jobbing psychologist. I work a lot with dreams and imagery, uh, as you'll see from my presentation, which is 120 slides long, and I'll be whizzing through it, so it will be quite dreamlike. So what I'm going to talk about are two things that don't seem to make sense, which are dreams and delirium. <coughs> and this is the big challenge that people have with working with dreams, with delirium, with delusions, with liminal states, is they just don't seem to make sense. So I'll be sharing a, a naturalized sense-making approach of how to actually engage with someone and help them make sense of a situation. So I'm from Scotland, so I'm not a big football fan. <laughs> Uh, but apparently this was a big deal this year, that <laughs> Leicester City won the cup. Uh, prior to that, people thought the chances of this happening were nonsense. Uh, but it turned out to be sense. Uh, another thing that happened this year that seemed nonsensical <laughs> was this, uh, and particularly this man here, who, uh, uh, a wonderful description of him, he has the demeanour of a small-time Emmerdale villain. <laughs> That was thought to be nonsensical, and now it makes sense. Even more nonsensically, you can see this is where this is probably going. <laughs> Misogynistic, xenophobic, racist, compulsive liar. He, he is very sleep deprived, which may account for a lot of it. This was meant to be nonsensical, now this makes sense, kind of. Um, I know I'm a follically challenged Scotsman, but Donald Trump's here. <laughs> Is it nonsense or nonsense -er? or does it make sense? But what happens when the winds of change blow from those Russian steppes or those Chinese deltas and this gentleman turns up in your ICU? Is that sense or is it nonsense? If he claims to be the 45th president-elect of the USA, how, how do you engage with that? So I'm just going to share some of my experiences of working with some people uh, in an ICU, post-ICU, and also the processes that I use working with dreams in, in most of the work I do. So I have to make it absolutely clear here uh, that I am not psychic. Or psychic. <laughs> I don't claim to be psychic. Uh, a lot of people think that anyone who works with dreams is psychic. Uh, people like Russell Grant, who's a lovely man, fills out a jumper nicely, claims to be psychic. Uh, he's not, so I'm not doing anything like that at all. Uh, so, uh, also, I'm not using any sort of mechanistic approach. Uh, I'm not really a big believer in things like neuro linguistic programming, thinking of the brain as a computer, uh, simple input, simple output. So I'm not using a mechanistic approach, I'm using a blended, naturalised sense-making approach. Does anyone know what this image is? A cave, fantastic. So uh, some people think it's the eye of a monster. Uh, some people think there's some tremendous fluid going on here. Uh, does anyone know which cave it is? I know this is a long shot. <laughs> It's the largest natural sea cave in the British Isles. It's a place called Smoo Cave in the far north of Scotland. And this is the view from the bottom here. So the way that I work in naturalised sense making is always be connecting the outer world with the inner world. So it's all we're doing all the time. We have two worlds going on here and we're connecting inner and outer. It's a very simple framework. Inner world, what's happening inside, ideation. Outer world, what's happening outside, sensation. The bit that we're really interested in is the circumference here, this boundary, because that's where all the action is. That's where the self is emerging. So these two guys, Baumeister and Bushman, they're both sociologists. Uh, there's been a lot of work done in this area recently, and as they say, the self emerges between the biological processes inside and the socio-cultural network outside. 
I said that I don't use a mechanistic approach, a simple in and out. I'm using conceptual blending as described by Faconi and Turner in their wonderful book, The Way We Think. So what appears to be quite a simple outcome or output in what your patient or client might be saying comes from a whole variety of inputs, and a lot of those might not be completely obvious to start off with. So we're looking at a complex process, and we're seeing it how it emerges at that boundary between inside and outside. So just to emphasize that point again. So that's quite good. I think we're about 20 slides in at seven minutes past two. So it's looking okay so far. <laughs> Does anyone know who this gentleman is? So he, 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 William James, fantastic. <laughs> So uh, he looks like a hipster. He looks like he might be running a, a breakfast cereal bar in Camden, uh, but he's not. Uh, he's William James, the father of American psychology. Uh, he wrote a really famous book, The Principles of Psychology. It was published in 1890. So he was kind of a contemporary of Freud's, who published The Interpretation of Dreams in 1899. Now, in 1890, so nearly 130 years ago, William James' view was that the person inside was effectively observing a screen. It was like going to a large IMAX theatre where you were completely immersed in something that was going on and you were simply observing a stream of data and interpreting it. Now, a lot of people still have this perspective, but it doesn't really work in real life. So we've moved on from William's view and not too far after that, now, I, I don't know if anyone will know who this is, uh, apart from the fact I've said his name. <laughs> you could have been in there far more quickly. So this is Thomas Graham Brown. Uh, he was a Scottish neurophysiologist. Uh, he was also a very famous mountaineer, so that's why he's looking like that and not looking a bit more doctoral. He said something really important, that the function of the senses is to modulate internally generated imagery. Now, what he meant by that was that where the sense of perception comes from, it's not from observing streams of data from the outside, it's actually from making sense of all the imagery that you're generating inside. Recent work by guys like Stanislas Dehan, um, previous work by Benjamin Liebe, show that at least 98% of our emotions and thoughts occur at an unconscious level. This is what Freud called ideation. But there's 98% of your inner life that you can't access consciously or rationally. And the only way that you can connect with it and understand it and use it is through imagery. Usually through naturally and consciously generated imagery in dreams, delirium, or working with imagery creatively. This work has been consolidated a lot recently by Rodolfo Linas, Professor Rodolfo Linas, uh, a Colombian. Uh, he works a lot with consciousness, and he has, in consolidating that work, he said consciousness is fundamentally a closed-loop property. So the, the way I work with this, I've got a very simple framework that I use. Uh, it has four parts to it. So we start off with the imaginal part. We're all constantly generating imagery. Everyone in this room is doing this right now. You're largely unaware of the imagery that you're generating. What we actually do with that imagery is we then validate it. We use our senses to understand how the imagery we are generating is enabling us to make sense of the world around us. We then use real things in the outside world to symbolize our inner life. So there's a symbolic aspect to it. So we hear this a lot in language, in metaphor, that um, if you take a mechanistic approach, you can say, well, I feel like I'm heading towards a, never, a mental breakdown or I'm going off the rails if you treat the body as a machine. But we use, constantly use the outside world as a way of symbolising the inner world. In Julie's example, where she's standing at the bottom of Julie's mountain, we hear this in our language, we've got a mountain to climb here, there's a mountain of work, it's a real uphill struggle, and so on. And then finally, based on the work of... Stanton Wortham and Edwin Hutchins, we then disseminate ourselves into the world around us. So this is the model that I'm working with. And the really important part is where it breaks down between imaginal and validated. Because someone who is delusional or 
producing hallucinations or in a liminal state will be having challenges connecting the imaginal to the validated. And that's just how it sits on the boundary between inside and outside. When the validation part, I'm not going to ask you who this is because I have no idea who it is. <laughs> it's a man. Um, when that connection between imaginal and validated is not working or functioning as well as it could do, then you will naturally start to hallucinate. So this is now a flotation tank. Uh, has anyone experienced a flotation tank, been in one? It's a very, it's a lovely experience. Uh, someone up the back there. Uh, one of the things that happens in a flotation tank is that you will naturally start to hallucinate within three or four minutes of being in there because you don't really have any sensory feedback to validate the imagery that you're creating. It also happens in solitary confinement, which can seem like that if you're in an ICU. Mm -hmm. uh, here's someone quite famous, the cooler king in solitary <coughs> confinement there. And you'll start to hallucinate quite quickly in there. <coughs> so these are all liminal states. Well, when I say liminal, it's that area, that threshold mm -hmm. between making sense, validating something, and constantly producing images. So that's the liminal state. I'm not going to ask you who that man is either. I have no <laughs> idea. Uh, but this is Cramond Island near Edinburgh. So other states like this, liminal states, uh, we have sleep paralysis. Has anyone had sleep paralysis? Yeah. So this is a really, really uncomfortable experience to have. What effectively happens in sleep paralysis is usually your body is very fatigued, but your mind is quite active. So when you wake up, it feels like your body's paralyzed, but your brain is very active. And because you can't move, you tend to get anxious, so your breathing gets very shallow, and your chest constricts. And when your chest constricts, it feels like someone's squeezing you or hugging you or sitting on your chest. And, and this is the source of all the myths and legends about succubi and incubi and spirits that come in the night and abductions by fairies and elves. Um, the German for nightmare is still Albatron, which is, means an elf dream where you're abducted and taken away by elves. So that's sleep paralysis. Another one is lucid dreaming. Uh, I might ask you where this tree is. It's quite a famous tree. This is turning into... Yes, there we go. Steel rig. It's the sycamore that Kevin Costner stood under. So... Um, it's good to have some audience participation here. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this, this happens in lucid dreaming. So does anyone lucid dream or experience lucid dreaming? Yeah. So in a lucid dream, you actually become aware that you are dreaming, but manage to keep yourself in the dream state. So it allows you to have choices in the dream. And it's one of the most wonderful experiences you can have. It's a fantastic experience. It's very, very healthy because it allows you to take situations or challenges from your waking life and then work through them and explore them in the lucid dream in which you're all powerful. Uh, it also happens in uh, this liminal state, hypnagogia, uh, which is it's coined, it's a term coined by a guy called Andreas Mavromatis. He's a Cypriot. In his 1983 thesis, he uh, came up with this term. And hypnagogia is that liminal state between waking and dreaming. Uh, we all go through it twice a night when we go to sleep and when we wake up in the morning. And it's usually a precursor to lucid dreaming. But it's where you are generating imagery and you're overlaying that on your surroundings. So you've got an awareness of... So it seems like you might have something in the room with you. You might experience a presence or a shadow or an intruder or an attacker. So hypnagogia is just that state between waking and dreaming, a liminal state. Um, another liminal state is hallucinations. Does anyone know who this is? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. So it's George and Sandra in the film Gravity. This is where she's hallucinating that he's still alive. So this happens in hallucin hallucinations also. And it's at this boundary between the inside world and the outside world where you are creating lots of imagery but not validating it. The, your ability to validate what is actually happening around you is not functioning as well as it should. So, 
I'm not going to ask you where this is, because if anyone knows that, it would be amazing. <laughs> it's actually on a mountain called Benmore Ascent, um, in the far north of Scotland again. So Julie and Dorothy were talking about disorientation. And this is what it can feel like when that connection between what's happening imaginally and what you're validating starts to break down. You get disoriented. You don't know where you are. You don't know what's going on. And all the time, what you're trying to do and what your client or patient is trying to do, they are trying to orient themselves. So this is still on Benmore Ascent, but can anyone see what might be of value in this image? Eggs. Eggs. Well spotted, yeah. So this is a golden plover's nest that I chanced upon as I was walking through the mist there. And I began to orient myself at that point. So when we're working with someone, we're trying to get them from disorientation back to orientation. And the interesting thing about conceptual blending and working with imagery is that you will start to get resonant imagery. You'll see the same images coming up again and again, or you'll start to fit images together, as I've done here. This is looking down into the nest, and that forms the same sort of shape as my meaning-making framework. <laughs> So, right, does anyone know who this is? This is a long shot again. No. This is a guy called Irving Goffman. Uh, he's the father of modern sociology. I know it's sounding a bit patriarchal after William James, the father of American psychology. <laughs> Irving Goffman and a guy called Charles Fillmore are famous for what's called frame semantics. So what frame semantics does is it allows you to make sense of a situation, to contextualise it. So as a Scotsman again, if I walked on here in a kilt and playing bagpipes, that would be fine. You'd be kind of okay, that would make sense. If I walked on in Native American Indian headdress or wearing a fez, that would seem a bit unusual. This guy, anyone know who this is? No. George, George Lakoff? Yes, did you say that? Yes. So George Lakoff, uh, I could say he's the father, he's more grandfatherly, of cognitive linguistics. So the reason for mentioning these people is that the way that I'm working here is using images as a way... Come in, come in. You've missed all the good bits, but don't worry. <laughs> Some exciting things to come. So this is how a cognitive frame or a semantic frame works. Uh, does anyone know where this is? Scotland, fantastic. <laughs> um, yeah, that's going to be, it's obvious. This is Shahawian, it uh, means the, the mountain of the spirits. It's where the Earth's mass was first measured and uh, contours were invented. But more importantly, so in here we've got a mountain, we've got a featureless expanse, we've got a track through here, uh, and we've got a skyscape. So those are the things that are making up this cognitive frame. Uh, here's another image. See, we've got some steps going someplace, some steps you can take, creating a safe space, uh, making a connection through some turbulent emotions, and creating a connection and reflecting on it in a tranquil manner. So just working with the imagery all the time. This is what your clients and patients will be coming up with. So here's an example of cognitive framing, how to analyse a dream, how to make sense of what someone is telling you. Imagine, for example, you can't start your car in the morning or it starts sometimes, it's autumn, it's damp, it's quite frustrating, you've not had time to take it to the garage or fix it yourself. You're also having problems getting your career started. You've got a <laughs> career starting problem. You've got frustrations there, you're really revved up about something, you can't gain any traction, you want to move forward. Those frustrations will come out in real life, you'll have frustrated <coughs> drive and ambition. And when you create imagery about it, when you create dreams about it, you will use your car, your non-starting car, as a way of symbolising your frustrated career ambitions, that you just can't get anywhere with what you're trying to do. That is, in about 20 seconds, the best way to work with a dream or an image that someone's producing that seems to make no sense. So back to Shaharan again, now very familiar. What we're looking at again is the track, the mountain, the sky, the featureless expanse. Does anyone know where this is? 
Glen Cope, that's close. It's the most northerly mountain in Britain. Again, uh, I'll save its name until later, keep you in suspense, keep you excited. Uh, it's Arkle, it? No, it's quite close. It's, quite, it's a bit taller than Arco, there's a clue. But again, the important thing is we've got a sky, we've got a distinct mountain, we've got an expanse, we've got a road. And where's the road going to? What's it the road to? In a validated way, it's the road to some place, some grid reference, some place on a GPS. But in a cognitive framing way, from your patient's viewpoint, it's actually the road to recovery. It's going to be a bit of a journey for them. Are they making progress on the road to recovery? They've got a mountain to climb. It's an uphill struggle. They might be a bit disoriented. And what you have to do, back to Steve again, is you have to engage with that boundary. Even though what they seem to be saying makes no sense, you have to engage with the boundary. That boundary to them doesn't really exist. It will be the same either side. I'm not going to ask you where this is because I'm quizzing along now. So the, the way that we actually do this is we name the connection. That should say connection underneath there. So we name the connection. We reflect on that connection. We expand the connection. I'm sure you all know where that is. And then we work that connection. So this is the process that we're using in this. So here's the first example, and I'm about two minutes behind time here. So the first example is it's called Feeding the Snakes. It's a 57-year-old man, uh, post-ICU. He has a large carcinoma behind his sternum. Uh, it, it's lung cancer. He's never smoked. He's been pretty healthy, but he had testicular cancer when he was 21. And a result, as a result of the treatment that he had then, he's developed this carcinoma. He uh, seems a bit delirious. He seems to be talking nonsense. He keeps telling the staff that he is feeding the snakes. Uh, he has a feeding tube. He's got various tubes going into him. He's feeding the snakes. He's got to feed the snakes. That sounds like nonsense. But if you take it from a cognitive framing point of view, you just think, right, what in this room looks like snakes? It's all these tubes here. Uh, he says one of the snakes is breathing fire. One of the snakes is breathing fire and it's really hurting him. And when we explored this a little bit more, we found that one of the, the tubes where it was, um, it, it was his feeding tube, uh, it was quite badly inflamed. So he got an anti-inflammatory from that. But you can see in this, it sounds like nonsense. He's feeding the snakes. One of them is breathing fire. But actually, he's trying to communicate something. He's in the imagery that he's generating, he's actually trying to make sense of his situation and say what's going on. The other backstory to this was um, his wife uh, is quite matriarchal, uh, quite dictatorial almost. She had never allowed him to grow a beard at any point in his life. And now because um, he is in hospital, his skin's very sensitive, uh, he has to grow a beard and she decides he looks very handsome, he looks very heroic. So then he feels um, his next, uh, what sounds like nonsense, is that he is Indiana Jones, hence the image here. Uh, he's Indiana Jones, he's feeding snakes, he's fighting snakes. He is also running away from a big ball. And this could be his carcinoma, or it could be the ball just from his testicular cancer 30 years before. But... There's no right answer here. You're just taking information in and you're making the best hypothesis from it. So in working with this, I didn't say to him, you're crazy, there are no snakes in here. I just said, tell me about the snakes. Mm -hmm. Name the connect. Tell me about the snakes. And he said, there's lots of snakes. I have to keep feeding them. One of them is breathing fire. And then when he's talking about Indiana Jones, I asked him, tell me what you're going to do that's going to be really heroic. And he said... I'm, I'm going to fight this, I'm going to be really heroic about it, I'm going to be a real hero, I'm going to escape any challenges that I encounter. So all I was doing with that was, I, I wasn't just agreeing with him going, there, there, that's fine, uh, or just trying to humour him, saying that's not happening at all, there are no snakes in here, and you're not actually Harrison Ford. I was just <laughs> saying to him, just trying to make sense of what he was saying. Uh, this one is uh, an 87-year-old woman with a, a brain tumour, recently had uh, a really bad seizure. 
she thought she was in a war zone in the Middle East uh, and she was under constant attack by terrorists. Uh, where the, the tumour was, was in her brain, she, um, that affected her motor skills. So quite suddenly she would fall over or have her limbs doing uncommanded gesturing. So I just, again, tell me about it. Tell me about what's happening in your life during wartime. She said, the terrorists keep attacking. Tell me about the terrorists. I don't know when they're going to attack. I don't know when they're going to attack. So that was the key thing for her. <coughs> It wasn't so much that she was talking nonsense. She was worried, she was wanting some information, some way of predicting when she might have these attacks again or when something might happen to her. So she was just trying to make sense of what was happening around her. Uh, she was also very keen to get a gun to shoot the terrorists and uh, combat them. Obviously that couldn't be allowed. But it did, um, the, the question from that is, uh, what sort of gun would you like? Well, I want a really big gun. Well, uh, we can't let you have a gun in here because it's a hospital. Uh, what other weapons can you use or what other information can we give you? So all she really wanted was information so she could try and combat unexpected attacks. So again, just working with the imagery here. Uh, this one is a 92-year-old miner. He is suffering from dementia. Uh, and he's recovering from a bout of pneumonia. Uh, and he kept saying he was waiting for the cages, which again just sounds like nonsense. But as you can see from this image, this is how miners go up and down into mines. The other interesting thing about this was his younger brother came to see him a lot. Uh, his younger brother was a mining engineer, so he could fill in some backstory. Um, the recovery ward was right beside the lift shafts in the hospital. So he could hear his lifts going up and down all the time. And when he kept saying, I'm waiting for the cages, what he was actually saying was, I want something that's going to lift me out of here. What's going to lift me out of here? So again, just asking him, just naming the connection, waiting for the cages. What cages are you waiting for? And he said, the cages, the pit cages. Uh, reflect, reflect, the reflecting question is just kind of an opposite question. So uh, if the cages don't come, what are you going to do? I'll just have to stay here a bit longer. Uh, we expand the question, what other ways can you get up to the surface? Um, he didn't know, but we'll look at other ways of getting you back up to the surface. And continually working that connection. Sometimes your patient will be talking nonsense, but there's usually some sort of grain of truth in what they're saying. Also, because he was recovering from pneumonia, he had breathing difficulties. And there was another cage he kept asking for, which was the cage with the bird in it. He was looking for a canary to know what, uh, at what point it was safe to breathe OK. So I've got about a minute left. But that just gives you some idea of how to work with any apparent nonsense that someone is talking, just to engage with it and start asking them questions around it. And just have an open mind. Don't judge them thinking they're crazy. Just have an open mind about how you engage with them. Uh, so that's the first step, is just take that first step. Uh, those are my feet. Uh, orient the patient, orient the client in cognitive space. Listen to the imagery that they're creating. Uh, this mountain is Ben Hope, the most nor northerly mountain in Britain. I quite often go up there, it's a beautiful place. I camp up there, so it's camping up there in midsummer, and that's me looking very cheery. If you want to find out more about the work I do uh, in dreams, uh, then you can visit my website, emosdreams.com, and five seconds over. So thank you very much for your attention.